Merry Christmas, Christchurch Online. Thank you for joining us today. We are so glad to be with you, and we're so glad the ministries of Christ Church are not limited to who can drive to our live campuses, but literally spread throughout the world. I hope you have an incredible Christmas. Join us as we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us, and all who will believe, will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all, all thrones. In dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. And the angels cry, holy, all creation cries, holy, you are lifted high, holy. Holy forever. And if you've been forgiven, oh, if you've been redeemed, come sing the song forever to the Lamb. And if you walk in freedom, and if you bear His name, Come sing the song forever to the Lamb. We'll sing the song forever and amen. And the angels cry, Holy, all creation cries, Holy, you are lifted high. Holy, holy forever. Hear your people sing. Holy to the King of Kings. Holy, you will always be. Holy. Is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all your name is the highest your name it's the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. And the angels cry, holy, all creation cry. Holy, you will always be holy, holy forever. You will always be holy, holy forever. 
As we prepare for our morning offering today, I want to remind you that you can give online through mychristchurch.com slash give. You can also text to give your tithes and offerings today as we worship through giving. Let's pray together for today's offering. Heavenly Father, today as we celebrate the birth of your Son, Lord, we thank you for the greatest gift we've ever been given. Now, Lord, we worship you through returning some of the gifts that you've given to us through the means that we have financially. Lord, we pray that you'll use these tithes and offerings. Use them to do great work at Christ Church in and through us as your body here at Christ Church. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this ministry that we have here to serve our community, to serve one another, and to reach the lost for Jesus Christ. Be with us, Lord, as we go into this new year, as we celebrate Christmas with our families, as we celebrate even those that aren't with us today. We ask all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I sing praises to your name. Praises to your name. The name that's so much higher than all names And all honor to your name All honor to your name The name that's so Greater than all names I'll be lifted up I'll be lifted higher Be lifted up Be lifted I sing praises to your name. I sing praises to your name. The name that's so much higher than all names. And all honor to your name. Yes, all honor to your name. The name that's so much greater than all names. higher 
Oh, be lifted up, be lifted higher and higher and higher. Be lifted up. Oh, be lifted higher. Be lifted up. Be lifted high. Well, Merry Christmas. We are so grateful that we get to share this Christmas day with you. My name is Reverend Mike. I'm the Senior Associate Pastor here at Christ Church. And we are sharing with you today one of the most wonderful and precious messages of the church year. It is the Christmas story. You know, uh, a few years ago, my daughters were wanting a, a dog. And for us, me and my wife Valerie, it was just not the right time. So we decided to settle on buying a couple of beta fish for both of my daughters. Now, of course, that was low maintenance for me and Valerie, and it gave the girls something to call a pet and begin to teach them a little bit about responsibility and what it means to take care of something. We told the girls that they were going to be responsible for these fish, and really their main responsibility was that every day they had to feed the fish. Every morning, a couple pellets to one of uh, to their fish, uh, and those tanks were in their room. Well, this year we actually planned on getting a dog for the girls this Christmas. It's the right time. But a couple months ago, we had an opportunity to get an eight-week golden doodle puppy. And so we did that. We got that golden doodle. His name is Theo. The girls absolutely love this dog. And as a parent, it has been a joy-filled experience to watch them play with their new puppy. Well, my older daughter, she's done quite well with having both a dog to be responsible for because they have to feed the dog and take the dog out a little bit and still having a fish. My younger daughter, though, her interest has waned in the fish. Back in August and September, Valerie and I would ask our daughter, Ava, have you fed your fish? And she would say something like, oh, I forgot. And she would run back to her room and feed her fish. Valerie and I, we kept telling her again and again, Ava, you need to feed your fish. And she started to say, I know mommy. I know daddy. Well, guess what happened a few weeks ago? Well, Valerie was walking around the house. She goes to Ava's room. And in Ava's room, Valerie saw the fish. It was positioned vertically, not moving at all. So what does Valerie do? She goes out to the living room, talks with Nora and Ava, and says, Ava, I think your fish has died. Ava's eyes get really big, and her and Nora run back to her room, and Ava sees the vertically positioned fish, and she takes off the top of the tank, and she just splashes a little water at it like that was going to do anything. Then they just stared at the fish for a couple moments as it was sitting, or really uh, just there quietly, and not moving at all. And then after a moment, the bottom of the fish's tail just wiggled just a little bit. When Ava saw that, she said, bring me the fish food. Well, bringing the fish food at that point, too little, too late. Ava neglected her responsibility of taking care of that fish because that puppy was just too darn exciting. You know, responsibility... It is a wonderful gift that God gives to us. You know, today we're going to visit a group of characters that are given a responsibility, entrusted, if you will, on this special day of Christmas. It comes with the Christmas message. Well, we begin where the Bible places the story of the birth of Jesus. When it first starts in Luke chapter 2, it is zoomed out, and it has really a worldwide frame. It starts out with Rome and with Caesar Augustus, one of the most remarkable leaders that Rome ever produced. Then we see the Bible go from the zoomed out portion to zooming in to a young couple. The couple, of course, are Joseph and Mary. 
they are, Mary is pregnant, Joseph is her fiance, and they are traveling 90 miles to a town called Bethlehem. The couple are unable to find a guest room because of the demand of the census that has been put in order. Now, this is a considerable concern, especially because the pregnant Mary is about to go into labor. They have no choice but to stay in animals' quarters, and the woman gives birth to a son wrapped in strips of cloth. They have to lay down this baby in an animal trough. Here on a dining room table where animals normally meet, sleeps a baby, King Jesus. We are zoomed in on this tapestry of holiness and glory and, and a baby in an animal pen that represents really the muck that comes with living in this thing that we call the world and being a part of humanity. After that, the Bible begins to slowly zoom out, if you will, and starts to bring in a couple of new characters for us. Here's what the scripture says. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flock of sheep. So it's nighttime. We have the newborn baby Jesus. We have Joseph and we have Mary and they are all resting. Resting in the way uh, that happens after the birth of a child. The exhaustion, especially of the firstborn child. There's those feelings out there of of happiness and satisfaction, but also with the firstborn, there's a little bit of fear. The reality of knowing that this baby, this responsibility, is now yours and no one else's. You know, uh, Valerie and I experienced that with our first child, Nora, when she was born. Nora was born at nighttime, about 9.30 at night, and everything went well and she was help healthy. We were grateful for that. Now, leading up to the birth, uh, of Nora, our firstborn, we wanted to do everything that we could do to prepare. So we read books about being first-time parents. We went to classes about how you care for a newborn and an infant. We really wanted to be as prepared as we could be. Well, after Nora was born, she cried a little bit, but she got swaddled up by the nurses pretty quickly, and she got laid down and fall uh, fell asleep. Well, all was well that night. Valerie was resting in her hospital uh, bed. I was in the chair. It's about 12:30 at night, and Nora was in uh, one of those clear bins. You know those clear bins they put babies in. It kind of looks like, I don't know, like a drawer you'd have in a pantry. You know. So she, Nora's just kind of in there in that clear bin, sleeping. Then at about you know 12:30 that night. Nora needed a diaper change or something because she started crying. But let me tell you something. This was not the cry that we heard at 9.30 or 10 earlier in the evening, just a little baby cry. No, no, no. It was a piercing sound that had never touched the eardrums of Valerie, of Valerie and I ever before. And in that moment, Valerie and I just look at each other with eyes wide open, not having any idea what to do. We could not figure out how we could wrap our minds around the moment. The only thing I could figure out when Valerie and I were staring at each other while we we're hearing this piercing sound from Nora is, I said, call a nurse! So that's what we did. You know what the nurse did? The nurse comes in, takes Nora out of the, uh, the bin there, moves some granola bars around, whatever, picks her up, hands her to Valerie, and just walks out. We didn't know what to do. And then we really started to enter into the fear of understanding that this child was totally our responsibility. Now, here in the story, we may expect that things should be coming maybe more clean or more majestic and more blue-blooded or noble because this heavenly child was born in a filthy place, but it must be just brevity in this Christmas chronicle. Now we should expect, right, that the royal caravan is coming with all the dignitaries to come and sweep up this newborn ba baby and begin to place him in his proper place of honor on a throne, preparing him for his forever rule. We expect the map to zoom in on Jerusalem 
or possibly even Rome. But no, no, no. The map doesn't go that direction at all. We go just a little bit outside of Bethlehem and zoom in on who? On some shepherds in the silence of night beneath the stars in the open field. And we begin to realize here, if it already wasn't made clear to us, that this story is not getting cleaner as time goes on. It's not getting the royal treatment that we expected. Of all the places the story could have taken us, it's just a little bit outside of Bethlehem, in these fields, with dirty, smelly men and more animals, sheep. Now, at one point in the Bible, when we think about shepherding, it was a family business. It was respectable. As a young man, we can think about King David. He was a shepherd for his family. In our story today, though, we need to know that there has been a shift from the Old to the New Testament, and shepherding as an occupation is seen much differently. It's actually become quite despised. Shepherds were viewed as nefarious people, accused of robbery and using other people's land, they are accused of using other people's lands that they had no right to. The shepherd's occupation immediately earned them a bad reputation. They were the type of people that someone may see walk into a restaurant and it begins to stir up negative connotations for the other patrons of the restaurant. Assumptions and emotions that kind of come with their profession and, and identity. Shepherds carried a reputation that preceded them, and they were really the outcast of society. They had to wear that whenever they became shepherds. Now, not only did they have to wear this bad reputation because of their occupation, it was also a lonely job, particularly because of the nighttime element. A shepherd would have to stand watch in the quiet and the stillness, they had to make sure that the sheep did not wake up and wander off diligently. Or wander off. They had to diligently look after the sheep. Prowling predators were always there to try to devour the sheep. And so they had many, many hours and hours and hours consistently alone by themselves. Now, we have the story that brings this outcast and lonely people. That's where we're at on this map, if you will. It's not going to Jerusalem. It's not going to Rome. Not to the rich or to the powerful. We are in the silence of night. But at the same time, in this moment, when everything is silent, it's dark. Maybe there's not even wind blowing. Heaven is about to burst open with joy. Heaven wants to share about the miracle that has happened in Bethlehem. There is good news. An incarnate deity is here to save, to reign. But we are with dirty and perfect people. A lackluster group to say the least. Then, piercing in the silence of both the night comes a heavenly messenger. Here's what the scripture says. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. So out of nowhere, an angel comes to these shepherds like at the speed of light, suddenly as the scripture says it. The shepherds' senses had to be overwhelmed. Why? First of all, Obviously, it's an angel coming to them, but they had zero to compare this with. They didn't have electricity. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have computers. They didn't have a TV. They didn't have projection of light. They had none of that. They didn't know that you know, light could kind of appear out of no, without any real reason. This light isn't just something humanly engineered. Also, this light isn't just a beam of light as we think of like a light on a stage. This light has an omnipresent quality to the shepherds. It's, it's an encompassing light they find themselves in. The light has almost, even though they're in the middle of this field, the light has enclosed. All they can see is light, and that becomes the, the radiance of the glory of the Lord from the 
silence, the dark of night to this bright, bright light. I don't know about you, uh, but it's like uh, in the dead of night, whenever you turn on the bathroom light or something like that, I mean, that's bright enough, right? It hurts the eyes. The shepherds are experiencing something so stark in contrast. Now, before we go much farther with the story, we must stop and ask the question, Why is heaven bursting out to share with this group of men? Of all the people heaven could contact, why shepherds? We've established their reputation and their occupation, yet of course we've done it through a lens of negativity, haven't we? (laughs) Using eyes that seek to only find the rough edges in others and proclaim stereotypes as the ultimate truth of a person's identity. How else were the shepherds viewed? Well, the Bible actually can help us with that. Through the eyes of the Bible, shepherds were known for having a tender side. How? Well, they counted their sheep constantly, making sure that every one were accounted for. They didn't want to lose any of their sheep from the fold. And whenever they would lose a sheep from their fold, They would leave the entire herd in order that they could go find the one sheep that was lost. Shepherds had a tender side. Also, whenever one of the sheep were hurting, they got injured. The shepherd would take the sheep and put it around his shoulders and carry that sheep because the sheep was unable to walk. The shepherd had a tender side. Also, there would be times when Uh, The shepherds needed to make a crude fence for the sheep in order that they could get rest and not wander off. And, of course, we know Jesus sees shepherds in that light, right? Later in his life and his ministry, he compares himself to being a good shepherd that watches over and guides his sheep. The shepherds had a tender side to the sheep. And what I think for our story today maybe is, is perhaps it's just the quality that should be valued above all that maybe God saw in these shepherds is that shepherds are protectors. Shepherds protect. They protect sheep from themselves because sheep wander off and frankly, sheep can't take care of themselves well at all. Shepherds protect the sheep from predators. Every day and every night, we need to remember that wild animals would seek to devour the sheep. Shepherds were there to stop the attack. Shepherds were there to stop thieves as well. Whenever a thief would come to come and try to steal the sheep, the shepherd would say, not on my watch. And they would go and they would protect their sheep from thieves. Maybe you out there have that protector mentality and you can identify with that part of shepherding. When shepherds protected their sheep, they were had an understanding that they were entrusted with something valuable. And when they understood that, they protected it. Why would God esteem this protective quality? Because of the message that these shepherds are about to receive. You know, one of the most important things when it comes to the shepherd and the message is that they are going to be able to protect what actually is being told to them and happens. They're not going to add their own thoughts to the message that's coming. They're not going to allow a false teacher come and rip apart the account or alter it. And they are going to have the strength and courage not to allow them being a marginalized people to stop them from sharing the message. God was looking for someone who would protect the truth. And he couldn't find that person or that group of people in Jerusalem. He couldn't find that group of people in Rome either. He found the right people on the island of misfit toys in a field in the middle of the night. God sees a quality in these men that the world could not see. Why is heaven first bursting out to share the gospel with this group of men? God saw that if they were given a message from on high, they would protect it and not fear what other people might say or do. The men were trustworthy of the message that they were about to receive. Let's hear that message. But the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid. 
he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all the people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God. Now, you and I are about to receive a couple gifts from this angel and shepherd interaction. They're going to let us know about how we should feel about the birth of the child. Do you ever not quite know how to feel about news you've received? Maybe you've recently had that with people coming over for Christmas. You're not quite, maybe you heard someone's going to come over to your Christmas gathering or maybe a Christmas Eve, and you weren't quite sure how to feel about that. Perhaps there's some past history with that person. Maybe it happened a long time ago. Not sure if it mattered anymore. But ultimately, you lack the confidence to say that the person coming over is good news or bad news. Well, here we have to be still for just a moment in the Bible. We may know how this story is going to go, those of us who have read this story or heard it preached before, but the shepherds, they don't know what's going to come from this message. Is God going to punish them? Is God about to give them a message of judgment? After all, weren't they judged quite commonly by society? Why wouldn't the God who many of those people said that they serve bring that same judgment upon them? What is this angelic message going to bring? They had no idea. Would it be one of judgment? Nope. The message that the heavenly being was bringing is a message of good news. Friends, the Christmas message is good news. This moment, this day, the fear in our lives, in your life, it should dissipate. It should just kind of disappear. And it's not that fears that you're feeling today aren't real. Of course, they can be real. There's a messiness that we encounter every day with our lives. But here's what the message of Christmas is saying, is that there is a greater joy. The message the shepherds are receiving, the message that the shepherds that God is entrusting with the shepherds and we are receiving today is that there is greater joy than our fears. This isn't about happiness. Listen, I know our happiness can be here and then be gone in a moment. Our happiness is fleeting. If we live by happiness, we're just on the roller coaster and happiness is no match for fear. Fear is always stronger than happiness. That's why if we try to rest on happiness, it will always be overcome. But the Christmas message, friend, is that there is a greater joy. And whenever we have that greater joy that only Christ can give us, guess what? Our fears are quieted. Our fears don't control us. Our fears are not what lead us. Instead, it's the joy that comes through Christ this Christmas. The shepherds here, friends, are receiving joyful news how can we feel about the Christmas message of Jesus? Joyful. That's what the angel said to the shepherds. That's what they report to us. Here's the other gift from the interaction of the shepherd and the angels that you and I receive. The Christmas message is for all people. In the text, it zooms out again from this little place outside of Bethlehem in a field to the entire world. This is a big message the shepherds are receiving, an evangelistic proclamation of good news. The message is for all people. Now, originally such a Masonic uh, announcement would have been understand for just the people of Israel. But here we are seeing that the message of Christ reaches beyond national boundaries. It zooms out to all people. What can we feel about the message of Christ at Christmas? The message is for us no matter who we are or where we come from. And that is really good news for you and for me. Christmas is meeting us right here, right now. The gospel of Jesus Christ meets you right now, wherever you are at. This is good news because it is for all people, even you and me. Well, 
in the story, if one angel wasn't enough, which I'm sure it was enough for the shepherd, then an angelic chorus comes with many other angels on the scene. Of course, it affirms the original message the first angel bring, and they're singing these heavenly praises to God. And what is going on in this moment? God is trying to make it clear to the shepherds that he is their bringing a message. He's doing it in a, in a way that they can recognize that this truly is a glorious act that has, a, that has happened through the birth of Christ. And he's going to give the shepherds one last layup to know that the message they are receiving is actually from heaven. The shepherds will know the announcement is true once they see this child in a manger. The angelic announcement does not come in some type of mystical way. One day you'll see this like a prophetic voice that says in hundreds of years it's going to come. No, no, no. These are workers. These are blue-collared guys. They want to see it to believe it. And this angel is going, to, is going to give a message that says you're going to see it and you will believe. They connect it with concrete events. So the angels leave. The shepherds are left with this sense of anticipation. Well, will they do what they've been told to go into Bethlehem and see this baby? If they do, it will confirm the message is true. But it will also confirm this. It will confirm that they are worthy of being entrusted with a precious message. What happens? Let's look. The shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. And after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and, the angel, and what the angel had said about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story, well, they were astonished. An angelic presence, of course, it can't last forever. Angels leave. People have to respond. How do the shepherds respond? With swift curiosity. These tough men without any type of theological education, they take no time to debate. They make an immediate decision. Go to Bethlehem. See the thing that the angel had proclaimed. They wanted to be a part of the work of God. This was their free will to do so. And they said, I want to be a part of God's story. And what do they find? Well, they see God's work in the face of a baby lying in a manger. What else do they find through the confirmation of this sign? A God who wants them to be a part of God's story. A God who's confirming not only his son's birth, the Messiah has come, but also that these shepherds are much worth to God. God values the shepherds, even if the world, even if the people that they've experienced in their life do not show the same value. This is a God revealed in this moment that can see someone beyond their reputation, beyond their occupation, beyond what someone might say about them, whether it be one person or an entire group of people. And what God ultimately sees in the hearts of these shepherds that they are protectors, that they are worthy, that they can be entrusted with this incredible message of Jesus Christ. When all these wonderful ingredients the shepherds have experienced kind of mixed together, you think about the angel's proclamation, the good news, the confirmation of a sign, and the love that God has for them, it bakes into this fresh-smelling Christmas evangelistic dish. And the and the shepherds want to share it with everyone in whom they come in contact with. One word characterizes all the people that they share this message with. The people are amazed. And the shepherds become the first evangelists of Jesus. Surprise, astonished, greeted the first testimony about Jesus everywhere that they went. And surprise turns to marvel about what God has done and the word of this baby starts to spread throughout Bethlehem. Shepherds came. They saw what God asked them to go see. They proclaimed the findings 
to all whom would listen. Then what do they do? Turn back to their jobs with a new song of praise in their heart. You know, this year when I read this part of the Christmas story, I was really struck by the unexpected value that God finds in people. The shepherds were amazed by all that they were experiencing. There's no doubt about that, but the shepherds' friends were also amazed that God was inviting them to be a part of his story. That God found them trustworthy. You know, God searches to find people who are trustworthy of holding the gospel message with their life. And you are that type of person. You know, I invite you this Christmas that whatever you're going through, whatever mess that surrounds you, take a moment and think about the message of Christ this Christmas. Think about how the gospel is for you. The one who came incarnate desires for you to be a part of his story wherever you're at this day, no matter what you're going through. Maybe you're hearing this type of message for the very first time. Maybe you're just now starting to think about Jesus. Yes, you too are invited to be a part of God's story. All you have to do is turn to Christ, ask for forgiveness, and he will come into your life and incorporate you into this big story. Maybe there's some of you who have uh, been a part of God's story for some time, but maybe your, your interest is waning a little bit. Maybe the messiness of the world is taking you away from what Christ has done in you. I just want to remind you to stay faithful, to remember that God has entrusted you with a special message and that God will always guide you to the best path for your life. To end this message, I want us to pray together. I want us to ask God to fill us with the joy that comes through Christ coming to this earth. Remind us about the person of Jesus, how he and his work is applied in our life and also the value he sees in each one of us. Will you pray with me? Oh God, we thank you so much for this wonderful Christmas story. We thank you for the good news that comes from the gospel. We thank you, God, that this is not a message of judgment or condemnation. No, no, no. This is a message that you want us, that we can be a part of your story. This is a message that elicits joy. God, for those who maybe aren't feeling that joy today. Right now, wherever they're at, will you fill them with joy? Wherever they're at, God, fill them with your joy that comes through Christ. For those, God, who don't know you and want to start a relationship with you, God, we ask for forgiveness for for how we've fallen from your glory. And we pray that you might come into our life, that we might experience the joy of this Christmas message every day. God, we thank you. We thank you for sending us Christ, and we thank you for being with us through the incarnate deity of Jesus. Amen. God, you met me in my doubt. Turn my anxious thoughts around. Let your praise be in my mouth my whole life, my whole life. Open up my eyes to see Perfect love moving towards me You have shown up faithfully My whole life, my whole life So I'll bless the Lord At all times At all times My soul will Sing of your love at all times, at all times. You've got the whole world in your hands, so I surrender to your plans. You've been a father and a friend my whole life, my whole life. You resurrect in buried dreams. You're waking up the dead in me We've been making history My whole life, my whole life So I will bless the Lord 
at all times, at all times, my soul will sing of your love at all times, at all times, with that free breath I breathe in, I give it Lord, I will keep on singing for all of my days, for all of my days. With every breath I breathe in, Lord, I keep it back in praise. Lord, I sing it for all of my days oh for all of my days and I will bless the Lord at all times at all times yes my soul will sing of your love at all times, oh, at all times, and I will bless the Lord at all times, at all times. Oh, my soul, sing of your love at all times. At all times. Thank you so much for joining us today on this wonderful Christmas service. Thank you for being with us online. Would you please join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the incredible blessing that it is to come to be together with you in this house. We pray for every person, every family who has joined with us today, that they would be blessed and excited for this new year to come. We pray it all together in Jesus' name, amen.